Professor Brand is a specialist in public health medicine and after working in several health authorities and ministries of health in Germany, where he was director of Public Health Institute of North Rhine-Westphalia. Since then, European integration in health is the main topic of his work. And he's the past president of the Association of Schools of Public Health in European region, and also the president of European Health Forum and co-chair of the European Alliance for Personalized Medicine. As policy advisor, he serves on the European Advisory Committee on Health Research of WHO Europe and on the expert panel on investing in health for the European Commission. So his topic today would be European Union and global health. So welcome once again, uh, Professor Helmut. I hope you can hear me and uh, the audience today would be the healthcare professionals who are working into the healthcare industry in India in various capacities in the hospitals. It could be quality control or operations or pharmacology or maybe some of them are in physiotherapy as well. So that is your target audience for the day. So it's over to you for today's session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and um, happy to be online uh, from India at the moment in Manipal, but with a background from Maastricht. And uh, just some remarks in the beginning, let me see, just let me know if the internet connection is uh, breaking or there is a problem. Second is, um, I would like to structure this lecture in three parts because it's very difficult to concentrate a long time. And uh, in a way that will be three times 15 minutes or 10 minutes, plus five minutes discussion, plus five minutes break. So um, you don't have to concentrate for 60 minutes now, just for 10 minutes for one break. And then we can discuss if there are questions. But please allow me five minutes break so that I can recover my voice. If this is okay with you, I will try now the next trick to share the screen with you. And um, if I see it right, you see it now, and now you see the full screen. Is this okay? Can anyone? Yes. Give? Okay, good. So let's start. Part, first part is coming now. Um, you know, the president uh, of uh, the European Commission is uh, Dr. Ursula von der Leyen, and she gave a, a short introductory statement as it was about um, the EU presidency of Portugal in March uh, last year, so in COVID, but before the Ukraine war. And uh, let's see what she is telling you. Uh, sorry, Professor Helmut, we can't hear the audio. Okay. We can see, but we can't hear. You can't hear. Okay, then we better skip. But there are audio encryptions. I mean, there, we can read that if you want. Yeah, but no, not just hearing her voice would be much better. Then we skip this. Then we this. Uh, uh. Okay. Let's have a look at some, uh, what she is saying is global health is important, especially in COVID times. So uh, in a nutshell. Good. Um, let's have a look at what's going on. Um, some slides here are not the newest one. That's the reason why there is this red line of historic data. But it's important to have a look at them too. Um, Europe is the place of a lot of peaceful countries. You see on the top a list of the most peaceful countries and those who have a flag are part of the European Union because we have to distinguish between the continent Europe and uh, the European Union. And my talk is more about the European Union. So this selected group of uh, states that joined together 1957. 
So Iceland is the most peaceful country, not in the EU, but then Denmark, Austria, Portugal, Czech Republic, uh, Slovenia, Finland, you find them all. In between New Zealand, Switzerland, Canada, and Japan. So it's a very nice list, but it shows you very clearly that uh, it's a kind of, Europe can be something like a peacekeeping mission. How do the Europeans see the EU themselves? For example, EU as a place of stability. Yes, I totally agree, 66%. Uh, I totally disagree that uh, are 29% and 5% don't know. So uh, we have a majority for stability, but it's not so as that it's 80%. No, even 30%. Now things are beginning to change. The support for the European Four Freedoms. I guess you heard about the Four Freedoms of the European Union. That's the free the movement of people, goods, services, and money. And um, that means that you can start your business in Spain and offer your services in Estonia. Or you uh, work in Austria in the winter in the hospitality sector and uh, in the summer at the coast in Poland. So this movement is that you can put your money everywhere and you can uh, migrate without any allowance and you don't have to show your passport at the borders. So 81% of the Europeans say, well, that's a big deal. And only 14%, mm, uh, I don't think that this is important. So you can see that here, uh, this is really something that is valued. And uh, a lot of European Union countries have the Euro. So one currency that makes it much easier to do trade between the different countries and uh, to have a kind of momentum to the rest of the world. 70%. Uh, agreed that this is a good thing, but 25% say, well, let's see how this will develop. Better data from 2016. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change very much over the time. On the other hand, we see that the uh, distribution of the currencies changes over time. In 2015, 48% of the whole global uh, market for currency were the US dollar, that shrank to 43. The euro shrank too, from 33 to 30. How can this be? Because uh, the pound lost a little bit, the yen gained a little bit, but there's a new player on the, on the field. That's the Chinese renminbi, the Chinese currency. So this is something where we all now have to deal with that uh, in the economic powerhouse, there are some changes. And Europe is uh, the home to the most equal societies in the world. Here you see a list, green most equal, red less equal. And it's a list of the EU member states and the OECD countries. The Organization of Economic Cooperation uh, is a club of wealthy countries. And uh, here you see those who are belong to the European Union in blue and the other ones in gray. And again, Iceland, this little island is most uh, equal, followed by Norway, Denmark, Slovenia, Finland, Czech Republic, and so on. And um, in the other end, you find from Spain, Latvia, United Kingdom, Estonia, and then the United States, Mexico, and Chile come. So, it seems to be a nice place to uh, live in the European Union uh, countries. And you see this variety of all this. Somehow it's like India. India is like Europe. You have those different states with the different uh, uh, culture, language, and that is mirrored in European Union too. In 1900, Europe was 25% of the world population. That was really a, a big thing. But as you can see, Europe will shrink. In 2060, only 4% will be there. And not even being less, the demographic change will lead to a situation that this continent will get older. 
Europe will be the oldest in the world by 2030, in 10 years. The median age, not the average, the median, where are 50% of the population, which age do we have, will be in Europe 45 and in Asia 35, 10 years less. Uh, America is doing quite well with 40, Latin America even better, Africa is the youngest. The world will uh, be around 33, but this has a lot of implications how Europe will act in global health, because we have an aging society with totally different demands, for example, than Asia has. The European Union is quite rich, the company, countries that form it, and 50% of the whole worldwide spending on social security is spent in the EU countries. So even there are a smaller portion because they're rich and they can afford this kind of uh, social security offering to their citizens, 50%, half of the worldwide spending. So that is something one really has to remember when one is talking about European Union mentality. There is a health system with a health insurance, there is a pension insurance, there is um, um, uh, insurance against losing your job. So uh, that are um, all social insurances, so based on solidarity. And just look around in the world where else this kind of social safety net is. It's important to understand this, how Europe then will act in global health. In a way, if you uh, take together all the European countries and um, look at the money they donate for developing countries and humanitarian aid, then uh, it's 56% of the whole pocket. The US, 24%, Japan, Norway, Canada, and others only 7%. But the problem is, yes, if you to, uh, count it all together, 74 billion US dollars. But of course, when there is something in development aid, the French would like to have their label on the school they, they sponsor and um, the Danish their flag. So it's not a coordinated action. You can be proud of being the big, big, biggest donor, but you have to look behind the curtain what's going on. And all this has to be financed. So what we see is that Europe's share of the global GDP is shrinking. The United States will lose a little bit, or lost a little bit, but the EU from 26 on 22 in 2015. And it's still going down. And India, less than 2%. Now, uh, three, three, at the moment, it's four, four to 5%. So uh, there is a shift. Who, where the money is earned and where the money is distributed. The variety uh, of the European approaches to health can be clearly shown at this slide. This is from ECDC, the European Center for Disease Control, and they advise and help the European countries uh, how to deal with infectious diseases. This is all pre-COVID. And uh, so they put together what are the vaccination schedules in the different European countries. You can see the countries here, and it's only about measles. And what you can see is, well, uh, normally one would uh, expect uniformity because there are clear guidelines for measles uh, uh, vaccination from WHO, but in a way, every country seems to have a little bit a different Vaccination schedule. I don't know at the moment how this is in India, if each state will have its own vaccination schedule. But this shows clearly that, okay, there is variety between the countries, but it can't not be so big that you come up with such a slide. So a lot of things to consider. The mandate for health in the European Union is quite new. It was enshrined in the Maastricht Treaty in 1992. So exactly 30 years ago. And on 14th of June, we will have a Brussels a conference uh, where we analyze what happened to this health mandate. 
It was very weak in the beginning, developed over time. And when it became 20, we did an analysis. And we looked at what is in the mandate and what was she achieved. And we argued, well, the glass is half full. It's not half empty. That's totally different. Uh, you would expect that it's going down. No, no, it's already half full. And now, even 10 years later, I would say the glass is still half full, but it's a bigger glass because new things uh, came up in the last years. Let's have a look. What is the health mandate of the European Union? Don't try to read this. Uh, this is a legal text, that's Article 168 of the uh, European Treaty. But the most important thing is um, uh, that the first sentence, a high level of human health protection shall be ensured in the definition and implementation of all union policies. We come to this again. Then there are sentences like combating serious cross-border threats to health, so between the European countries and cooperation with third countries and the competent international organization in the sphere of public health. Let's have a look again. First sentence, high level of human health protection in the definition implementation of all union policies. That means health is not only managed in the directorate of health, no, it's cross-cutting in each of the different European policies, environmental uh, um, or the transport or economics. There should be health um, uh, implemented into. Sorry, I just have to cough. Sorry, now I'm back again. And um, this concept is called health in all policies. It's very important for India too. And uh, what can be learned from this approach 30 years um, ago that they started it is that health is a cross-cutting issue. And if you have environmental standards that are good, you protect the health of the people by this. If you have a safety belt regulation, you protect the health of the people. So this was very, very um, challenging, but very much forward looking, because everyone expected that there is a clear definition what healthcare mandate and so on. No, 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 no. This is a different approach. It takes longer to persuade people to have a look at uh, um, health. Just a second. But if it works and everyone gets used to this, this is really something that works. And then combating serious cross-border health threats is that those countries agreed that they inform each other if there are problems in our disease outbreaks and how to do this. And regarding the cooperation with third countries and the competent international organization, that means for example, WHO, that is a competent international organization and third countries are all those who are involved in it. So we have a mandate for global health uh, in the European Union too. So let's summarize, health in all policies, we can work on indicators, best practice exchange and guidelines, the cooperation uh, with third countries and the competent international organizations combating serious cross-border threats, but not the management of national health systems. How you, how you organize this is still with the member states. You can say that's a big drawback. Oh, we should have a national health system or a health insurance system all over Europe. No, no, don't, don't do this. Because history and uh, culture is so diverse and the power and the capacity to pay for the different systems is so diverse it's better to leave this to the member state, but to have an umbrella around this called the European Union. By this, I would like to make a short break for five minutes because we are already late. Uh, but before we go to the break, just are there any questions until now? Uh, thank you, Professor Holmet. I think um, for the time being, there are no questions in the chat box. 
maybe I'll ask the professionals to put it in the chat box and we can take it yes. after the next session. Okay. All right. So, so at, at six uh, thirty. Yeah, six thirty. Yeah. We will be back. Okay. All right. You may take little rest. So meanwhile, I'll invite uh, Professor Monica uh, uh, commenting on the session so far. Uh, hello. Oh, you take me by surprise. <laughs> I could I could make some similarity with your lecture when we heard you initially. Yeah, uh, I think it, um, I think it when, when we yeah. talk about uh, global GDP, you said the European share is uh, shrinking. That's what Professor Helmut has also mentioned today, that uh, in global GDP, the share of Europe is decreasing, but that does not mean that, you know, it is because the other players are coming in. Yeah, I remember this is what I that. yeah so that's a big similarity I could find today. So any other comment briefly for, uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes before Professor yeah, Helmut returns. I, uh, I was yeah. immediately saying two things because I tried when I started to talk about my health policy course, which was more on healthcare systems, I gave a little overview of the context around the European context. So we have uh, uh, said maybe in, in less details, uh, a few ideas of what uh, Professor Brandt just now recorded in more details. So, but what he said, I have two, uh, I have two things to say. One is of course, uh, Europe, I put also such picture, Europe was shrinking according to the figures, but as you said, it's because the other countries have been uh, growing and the figures are relative. It doesn't mean that Europe spends less on social policy now. It doesn't mean that it has less population. It is just less compared to India and, 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 and Brazil and, and China and, you know, the, compared to the world population. So this shrinking should be understood in the in this comparative sense. Yes. Uh, and the second thing is very similar about aging. Uh, well, I, I used to work a little bit in Japan where the aging is even worse and more visible also. Their whole countryside's getting empty from population and the property falling into pieces because old people died and the young people have left already 50 years ago to live in Tokyo and can't even remember that there's some family property up in the north. So um, I worked a little bit with these Japanese people and actually now I think it's Japan who is on the top, but it's already since a long time. So Europe came a little bit later with aging so we are living through what Japan has been living through now. So we will be aging, we will be more aged, but it's not sure that we will be the most aged continent with all these migrants coming to Europe and also birth figures go up in some in slightly France has very good ones. So um, demography is something which you can in a way very easily calculate because the women who give birth are already born, they're already there. But you never quite know what will happen the next 20 or 30 years. You know, suddenly people can make more children. Policy can uh, help families to get more children. Um, but this is a sort of detail. We, we can't look completely into the future. We have statistics and surely Europe will age. We'll be older in, in, in 10 years than it is now. The, the main point I wanted to make is it is not aging like a sort of uh, absolute thing, aging the it is a demographic transition and it will last something like 20 years, the aging. Once the bulk of all people are death, dead, you will not have this tremendous quick aging anymore, except if really you don't make children. So I think in policy terms, which is my, my way of looking at things, you should consider the aging problem as a problem um, that's coming that will last 30 or 40 years a difficult period, but it will not be uh, sort of forever. So you have also to, to look at it in dynamic terms. You know, the generations are, we have no lots of old people because we have this baby boom after the war. And once these people are dead, they are populations, the, the pyramids will grow like this. Now, they used to be like this. Now they are sort of like this the pyramids of ages, but they will in, in 30, 40 years in Japan and Europe, there will be something like this, something more stable. And then suddenly around 95 and 100 years, there will be sort of stop. 
um, mm. with a few individuals going higher. So we should see these things in a little bit more dynamic and relative terms. That's all I wanted to say. Otherwise, thank I enjoyed, <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed how, my, how my colleague is looking at the things. Thank you very much. <laughs> to okay, so thank you. Thank you for your input into the topic. Very, very relevant. So, no, Professor, okay. I, uh, I hope you are back with your next part. Thank you. Yeah, and I can, do you see it? Yes. You see it, no? Yes, sir. Okay, please, let's please, see what's please. happening. Let's see what's happening. Okay, the world is in crisis modus. 89, fall of the Iron Curtain, 2001, 9, 11, 2008, we had a financial crisis, then Arab Spring, refugee crisis, COVID pandemic, Russia, Ukraine war, what will come 2030? So there are always unexpected things. And I guess our audience, when you are around, you will have another 30 years to work. So at least three new crises will come in, while you are working, at least three. And they will be unexpected and not something that uh, we predicted. At the moment, we think in linear terms, for example, oh, in COVID pandemic, we needed respiratory machines and they were on short um, uh, supply. So we have to store resp uh, respiratory ma machines. Well, what do we do if the next pandemic needs renal dialysis machines? So uh, it's not so easy to look in one direction. We have to be a little bit more looking to the left and the right. When we now look back, what happened over the last uh, years? And this is an analysis from uh, some years ago where they looked back for 25 years of the European health policy. Then it started here, as you can see, with the uh, Treaty of Maastricht. Then a little bit later, the establishment of the European Medicine Agency. So one stop shop, if you want to get your uh, medicine uh, be available in Europe, uh, you send it there and uh, with the reports, and then you get the feedback if it's uh, made available. But the pricing will be different for the different countries. Uh, 99, 70 years later, the establishment of the Commission Health Directorate came. So seven years without an own directorate, it worked too. The first EU health program was some years later. Then ECDC uh, came up, the Center for Disease Control after the SARS uh, pandemic. And we had some tobacco legislation, blood, tissue, cells, and organ transplantation, because there you can best share uh, and work together. Cross-border healthcare, 2011, so it took a long time. Uh, the decision about serious cross-border health two years later, and the first reference network for rare diseases was in 2017. And when this was done, uh, 2020 was three, four years ahead. And there was very interesting, tackle antimicrobial resistance. And prepare for new global health threats. So it's not that people were not aware what could come, for example, with uh, COVID or antimicrobial resistance. And, but the risk was estimated in a different way. You have two ways or two components of a risk, the chance that it will occur and the magnitude of the effect. And in antimicrobial resistance, the chance that this will occur was already rated quite high and uh, the impact medium, but the prepare for the new global health threats like say a pandemic, this risk was seen from the impact very high, but from the chance very low. And as you can see, sometimes you get it wrong. This is how Europe is organizing this uh, uh, health issue. I think that's more something uh, when you want to look back at the slides, so we will skip this. One interesting thing about the European Union is that um, it never gets its things coordinated together. Uh, there is this saying, failing forward is something where the European Union is an expert in. Um, you have a crisis and then they all sit together and they try to find the most common denominator. They make a deal where no one uh, really is happy about, but it's 
what you can agree on. You never go too far because they are all afraid to lose competences to Europe. So lowest common denominator. And then, of course, there is a crisis. Then it says we need a new institution. So they put uh, money in the uh, pot and then the lowest common denominator deal is a half-baked institution. ECDC, EMA, all those institutions had not the full-fledged um, mandate in the beginning. Uh, it was created out of a crisis or something similar to this. And then the institutions, of course, begin to fail and there are negative spillovers, but then they learn by this and then they improve. And by this, then uh, in, in the next crisis, then this cycle starts again and another institution is created. But by this, there is deeper integration between the European countries. So not a strategic way forward. You all work in the health sector. You heard about health technology assessment. Um, that is really something that you can do together because the available literature is the same over the countries. 80% could be done together and 20% in HDA could be localized. But in this, it's a totally different, like here, uh, the countries cannot uh, um, agree on anything for over 20 years now. Now we have the first uh, HDA directive in, uh, that is uh, seriously discussed, but you see Europe learns only in crisis. So what the EU should do now in uh, global health? Uh, let's have an academic view. Three examples are coming. And you always have to look at the years. In 2014, uh, this article was published, Global Health in the European Union, a review from an agenda setting perspective. Uh, you heard about the expressions agenda setting and all this stuff already. So how was the situation? Why no European global health agenda at that time? And by the way, we don't have uh, one until now. The fragmentation uh, between the different countries is enormous. The fragmentation of the policy community, the lack of definitions of global health, and there were no common goals because you could not agree on them. Awareness should be there because there was thus in 2003, uh, we had the Tobacco Framework Convention, the Together for Health Strategy was there and there was a clear statement in a globalized world, it is hard to separate national or EU-wide actions from the global sphere, as global health issues have an impact on internal community health policies and vice versa. And there was already uh, Horizon 2020, the research program that was there, which where also non-EU countries could take part. So in 2014, it's eight years ago, our verdict was quite critical that there was no real uh, European global health agenda. 2017, the title here was, if not now, when? Time for the European Union to define a global health strategy. What was the situation in 2017? There was a Brexit vote. In a lot of countries, there was a kind of Euroscepticism. In the US, Donald Trump was just elected. We had the Ebola outbreak in 2014, where the European Union did not act very much on because it was far away. And the image of a bureaucratic institution uh, was carried on. There were, it was called bureaucratic talking club. On the other hand, the EU did set up a European medical corps in 2016. Nine out of 28 member states agreed to participate. The field epidemiological training in the Mediterranean was set up to 2017. Before this, there was a field epidemiological training for the EU member states. So something was happening. But again, a global health strategy was still missing. Regarding aid, there were economic interests, the transatlantic treaty and in, uh, investment part trade and investment partnership was uh, cut. Uh, there were public health threats. Um, the idea was a pandemic will come from outside EU. Yes. Define the work for uh, the director generals. Yes. Instruments like regulating cross-border threats 
or the international health regulations. We know that they were not the best in 2015, there was the last update, but the situation was not so good. And there was no strategy for European foreign and uh, um, activities and security policy. There was a European external action service, but without clear definition of a health mandate. And there was EU NATO cooperation. So when you look at this, uh, it reminds me a little bit of India some years ago too. So you have all these conflicts, how to figure out what to do. But what is now, now happening in uh, uh, 2021? How a European health union can strengthen global health. Global health is again about health in all policies that we saw very clearly. It's not only uh, developing new drugs, but it was also about the social and economic consequences. And trade is a very, very important issue. We saw now how those global um, trade chains uh, collapsed and what consequences this has. EU has the power. There is money, for example, for the European Green Deal, uh, where they invested huge money to get rid of uh, the uh, old kinds of fuel that we use. The influence is there. Uh, there is a so-called Brussels effect by setting standards. The idea is that when all those countries work together on the same standardization, then you can interchange parts. For example, if you buy a car produced in the European Union, from all member states, parts will be built in and they fit together because they are standards. There just has been a book about the Brussels effect showing that in a lot of areas from environmental to transport, agriculture, setting standards uh, is something that is a key for success. And the internal public health mandate can only be fulfilled when looking outside too. This is a statement from this commentary that we will all now after the pandemic underline because we are not alone on this floor. So what is a to-do to list? Use G20 to coordinate aid. And if I'm rightly informed, India will have the G20 uh, leadership for in next year. Work on transboundary security issues. Yes, that is very important. We have to talk to each other to make it happen. And not that someone is blocking. Uh, China's role in the beginning of the pandemic was not good by not sharing any information. We cannot force, but we have to make deals that this can happen. There is an internal external nexus for the European Union. This public health uh, paragraph and the one for trade are sometimes uh, uh, conflicting. And there is now a European Health Union debate. And uh, at the moment, it is very much on outbreak preparedness and only on this response. Um, and by this strengthening the EU roles internationally, but we have to think ahead. Next big uh, issue to come is climate change. And that really has no uh, 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 boundaries. And in India, uh, we saw now what uh, climate change really uh, means. And climate change, I think it was today in the news, makes heat waves 30 times more uh, often to be there. There are other views, for example, from the NGOs. Um, towards a new EU global health strategy, and uh, here, for example, three big issues were uh, mentioned. Support health systems in partner countries in order to achieve universal health coverage, to leave no one behind. To leave no one behind is WHO speed. Universal health coverage is um, something I think that is uh, common nomenclature now. Addressing health inequalities and the social, economic, environmental determinants of health throughout right-based approaches. Good governance is important to reach this. And because health systems are complex and dynamics, addressing neglected issue is essential to ensuring good outcomes. So that's something where uh, we all would say now, okay, this is needed, but is there time to do so? The industry view on this is a little bit missing at the moment. Um, for Global Health Europe. Uh, India, for example, is the 
biggest, you know, it's now the pharmacy of the world. And we, uh, for example, from Manipal, had the European delegation to India and Bhutan by uh, um, offering courses in regulatory affairs. I myself, in my former life in Germany, I was head of the Institute of Public Health, where we had to do the samples um, in the companies to see if they fit the European standard. That always was the case, but the sewage water from antibiotics was cleared in the Ganges. And it was uh, foreseeable that by this, uh, we would have uh, some problems coming up. And now we have to regulate after this. So again, I would make to, like to make a short break here before we come then to the last part of this presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. So the participants can also relax for five minutes and then we are into the last part of yeah. today's presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Okay, you have checked your email, your WhatsApp, and let's see now for part number three. So, uh, what the EU does. For actual work on pandemic, see the introductory statement of the commission pre president. You could, could not hear it, but um, that she listed what the commission did uh, to combat uh, COVID-19. Health in all policies is a difficult subject. Normally the shortest connection between two points, point A and B is a direct line. In health in all policies, that's often not the case. You have to take diversions and start with something else, uh, hope for a compromise. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. And in a lot of things, you have to go other avenues to reach your aim. For example, there are uh, issues um, uh, regarding the health mandate, uh, how directly it should be influenced. But um, for example, the country said no um, management of health system from uh, the EU is allowed. But after the economic crisis, then uh, everyone agreed, well, we should have an eye on the budgets, the financial budgets of all the different member states. Because we had some problems with Greece, Italy and Spain. And uh, as healthcare is often 10% uh, of the whole budget, uh, then it was automatically part of this scrutiny project. So not directly in the health mandate, but regarding economics terms. So sometimes regulations come via the back door. So let's have a look. What is the uh, uh, European Union doing in global health Europe? Um, this is a web page where everything is listed what the commission is doing. I made a screenshots and some following screenshot to show to you uh, what is there. And this is not much. And uh, last time I looked at it was 14th of April. So I guess nothing much changed until now. So there is the general sayings, yes, we work with the UN system together with the World Health Organization. You remember in the in the treaty, in the article, it said, yes, we can work with those competent authorities. And uh, we work together in health with a group tw of 20, the G20. So here the first time it's uh, recognized that, well, there might be some economic uh, consequences for health and health having consequences for the economy. And the G7, the more uh, well-off uh, countries. So it's about health security and growing a resistance to antibiotics and making health systems stronger. As you can see, making health systems stronger is not underlined. So there is no link to this. So at the moment, it's more about the health security, pandemic control, and growing resistance to antibiotics, AMR, uh, where a lot of activities are now there. The sustainable um, development goals play an important uh, role. And um, goals three aims to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And then they give the classical examples, infectious disease control, non-communicable disease, substance abuse, tobacco, vaccines, health financing. But on the other hand, when you really see what is the contribution of the European Union uh, to this, uh, then there is only a communication from 2016 entitled Next Step for a Sustainable European Future. And uh, there is a staff working document uh, for this. This is, this is quite low level of documents that you can produce. There is a sustainable development website and how the EU is helping to implement the 2030 agenda. But if you look at this, there are concrete missions missing. At the moment, it seems that the European Union is paralyzed by managing the COVID pandemic and is overwhelmed by now what has uh, uh, to be done. The EU global health policy defined in 2010 
identifies the main challenges and sets out four guiding principles. And um, again, this is the actual website, April this year, but the global health policy is defined in a document from 2010, 12 years ago. Um, I was part of this process advising on this, and uh, at least we now have that they're open to trade, financing, development, migration, security, climate change, environmental action, research, and innovation. Um, that is all not new. So you can see how long it takes that those things come into action. So the European Union is no fast mover. It takes a lot of time to negotiate. And it often needs crisis to bring about change. So never waste a good try crisis. That's the reason why everyone at, at the moment trying to use this window of opportunity to uh, uh, throw through this open window their ideas uh, what's going on. And there is a global health policy forum um, that is under the leadership of different director generals and uh, they meet in former times more often than now. And uh, on the other hand, it is quite weak. Um, the suggestions coming out there never took uh, real momentum. So the council conclusions that are uh, mentioned here are about a global health governance, universal health coverage, creating policy coherence between the different areas, ensuring that knowledge creates and benefits all. So in a way, 2010, that was not a very good situation. But then one politician, it was the chancellor of, of Germany, she realized, well, that's an ideal area for soft diplomacy. So she invested a lot in this. That's the reason why regarding Global Health Europe, a lot of uh, action has come from Germany and uh, a lot of institutions are dealing with this. And now, uh, for example, one of those WO preparedness centers will come to Germany because Germany is paying 50% of um, uh, the money for this. So you can see things are there. There are no surprises in this. It's the old stuff that will be with us for the next years, but it needs certain external triggers to that we can uh, work on it. Global Health Security Initiative was mentioned, uh, mainly run by the G7 plus states. It was, was set up in 2001, but the process is really, really so. What we had achieved was strengthening smallpox preparedness and response, improving international communication risk and management. Hmm. That was a problem. Those who were best in those stress tests for this, in the end, performed worst in, in the pandemic. Testing and enhancing laboratory capacities. Yes, there was something, but it needed a boost in the pandemic. Advancing global pandemic influenza preparedness and response. The same with the communication. Those who were on paper the best often did not perform well because political leadership was missing. And preparation efforts against chemical and radiological threats. Yes, that was something uh, that was, let's say, uh, mentioned there. So who did what, uh, when in the pandemic? Again, this is looking back. And we looked at the different uh, interventions the European countries did in the pandemic. And there were some countries here mentioned like the Swiss, that is this little white Swiss uh, cross. Uh, they are not in the European Union, but as you could see, the different measures were taken at different times from the different member states. It's inbound and outbound. You remember no flights to and from Europe and uh, I could not travel for one and a half years to, to India, so we had to do it all remotely. So you see that there's still a lot of diversity in this and that Global Health Europe is just starting its work in concrete terms. And it's overshadowed by economic downturn. And it has a big momentum until February. And now the Russia-Ukraine war has overtaken this. So when in the news, 
there was something about health issues. Yes, that we were on the agenda, but we are losing this momentum at the moment. So uh, we have to work on those areas like the G20 uh, summit that are coming, and especially from the Indian side too, because it will be an important issue to talk about. There are good models of good practice. For example, Shikara is uh, in the Managing the Prevented project, where European and um, Asian countries work together, tackling this AMR. And there are global hubs that uh, deal with AMR. But when we really do the groundwork, we see that still there is a lot to be done. And I'm looking very much forward for the next uh, cooperation agreements in the Erasmus Plus pro program between Asia and Europe. So the glass is just half full in global health Europe. It's not half empty because it never was more filled than now. And um, the topics are still the same. So the glass even didn't uh, get bigger. The pandemic was there, yes, but we knew about it before and we did not prepare well. So, uh, if you want to make a career in European issues, Global Health Europe might be a good topic because the next 10 years, a lot of things have to happen here. And if you want to have a short uh, reader about what health in the European Union is about, then download this book from the European Observatory. Uh, it's for free and they just two days ago published the third edition where Global Health Europe has now gained more pages and the pandemic is explained and all the things that normally uh, Ms. van der Leyen should have told you are mentioned here. So I always call it the Swiss army knife of European uh, public health. Um, this is something you should really have a look at if you are interested in European. So see you in Europe. If there are any questions, please let me know. We will share this uh, presentation. And uh, I'm looking very much forward to this cooperation between India and Europe and how global European health will be. So thanks again for listening. All right. Thank you, Professor Helmut. Um, it's now Q&A session. Over to Celia for that. Celia, you can take over from here. And uh, please. Um, um, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's always very refreshing to, to listen to your lectures. We have several questions from different topics. I think I will start with one question more on the economic side you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation. So do you believe that the trend, the current trend is that European societies are becoming more unequal and non-European societies are becoming more equal? So who is getting more equal and who is getting more unequal? So the question is that uh, European societies are getting more unequal and non-Europeans are getting more equal. Well, um, we have to have a look at this. Um, at the moment in the European Union countries, there was some unequal inequality uh, generated through the pandemic. But when you look at... Um, the equality index after distributions, after tax distributions and so on, uh, the European countries still are leading in the equality issue. Um, I don't know exactly how this um, will affect the non-EU EU countries. Um, Mr. Piketty has just uh, uh, published a new book about the inequalities and there he has the historic perspective, but the first time he's really saying what to do. Until now he was only explaining what there is. So I think a look in this book will help us to see what all those different countries should do now. Thank you. I'm actually looking forward to, to reading his new book. Uh, then we have two questions on India. So the first mm -hmm. one is, according to you, which is at the moment the biggest challenge for India in the field of public health? Aishman Bharat. Universal health coverage, you have 
uh, all the ingredients to roll it out. You have, um, uh, um, everyone has a smartphone, everyone can be reached, everyone has a bank account, everyone has an ADHA number. Um, HDA is coming so that are all the ingredients, GST was introduced, that are all the different ingredients you need to roll out universal health coverage that is a little bit more digital based and uh, would be a good possibility on the one hand for primary health care, state run and secondary care, how to harness the private sector. Health insurance gives India the possibility to harness the private sector and with all this new think, okay, let's eliminate the pandemic, the consequences that we have to work on, but there is a good chance uh, that this will be a driving force for the next 10 to 15 years uh, uh, to improve uh, the health of uh, the people in India. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's very good that you mentioned digitalization because it feels that we are very far in India from this universal access but it's true that the ingredients are there. So I think we should keep these into account. Uh, the next question um, regarding India and EU is from which issue do you think that EU and India can start a cooperation in the field of health? Um, there is this moment of the open window. So if we all write to Prime Minister Modi, what he should put on the agenda on G20, that uh, would help because uh, advice is needed for clear uh, ways what to do. There are certain issues that are coming up. One is, for example, when we look at, at economic terms again, Europe wants to be more independent from pharmaceuticals produced in India. Hmm. That can mean either getting the production back to Europe, or it just means that we have some, um, some storage in between. Uh, building brick uh, production areas would be a problem for both sides. So there is a chance for new, new negotiations. The other issue is when you look at the health in all policy aspects, global uh, climate change will come. And we just, as mentioned, had experienced what this means for us. Uh, uh, and now it's how to deal with the fossil energy, uh, uh, India um, is in the transition uh, and, for example, an energy summit would have very good health effects. So we should not only focus on direct on healthcare and uh, uh, we have to spend more money for healthcare in India. No, we should really train ourselves in thinking in health in all policy terms because it's more effective. Um, every article I read about India says, oh, and written by Indians, says, oh, it's all a problem. We need more money for the healthcare service. But when you look at the budget, only 70% of the money of the health budget is spent in India. So increasing this budget will not lead to anything because the health system is unable to distribute this. Uh, so this administrative system that you inherited by the British is really holding you back. So it would be much more clever to say, okay, let's make a deal with the private sector. We define uh, what will be reimbursed. We define the quality criteria and we monitor this because then, for example, universal health coverage would be achievable much uh, faster. Everyone in the health sector would know what would be reimbursed for which prices. So investment decisions would be much more uh, targeted and that this can work, have the Eastern European countries shown 30 years ago when the Iron Curtain fall, they all had to set up new healthcare systems. And we have now 30 years of experience of this. But, and there, uh, I talked to several senior policymakers in India, they never look at these countries. They look to South America and so on. And the reason is who speaks Estonian, Polish, uh, Slovakian, yeah. So it's a language barrier. And of course, some of this is published in English, but there is no knowledge transfer from this country uh, to India regarding the experience with health insurance, uh, social health insurance system. And we are trying now in cooperation with Manipal working on this to do this. So there are clear ways how you can speed up the process by health uh, you know, policy issues, 
not relying on the classical administration, but making good deals, social impact bonds and all this stuff. And with a hardcore uh, health uh, um, providers too. Thank you. Uh, in here, I must thank Monica Stefan. During her classes, she actually mentioned the uh, Eastern Eastern Europe countries yeah. as an example, and she also taught us that it's not only how much money you spend, it's how you spend it, and also exactly. corruption plays definitely a big role. Yeah. Uh, the next question is more on geopolitics. So the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and the escalation of the relations between US, EU, Ru Russia, and China Will this have a negative impact also for the development of truly global health policy? Um, if we play the card right, this might uh, be the opposite. It might be something that is um, positive for this. Because what, what, what we see is that now there is a tendency to look at China in a different light. So for example, India is now suddenly in the focus. Um, because uh, democracy, okay, decision-making is slow, but it's a democracy, you can deal with this. They keep uh, mostly towards the promise. I know there are a lot of hiccups is with Indian politics, but China is losing momentum. And the China-Russian, Russia uh, axis um, will isolate both of them. You see that a lot of companies retract also, not only from Russia, but from China too. I understand that India's position regarding Russia is um, due to the history of this connection. Um, and at a certain time, this will be modified a little bit too. And if India opens up for uh, good negotiations, then I think uh, this will be something positive. Africa is seeing the disadvantages to be in depth at China. Uh, so they are open up. Africa now has an own CDC since uh, I think one and a half years. So the collaboration comes and in the US, Mr. Trump is not president anymore. That means a lot. For example, CDC <laughs> was an agency that was NCAP. Uh, Trump said, I don't want any global health activities from CDC. And that was the best organized one that we had in the world. So they are now trying to catch up with the loss in manpower, knowledge, and money. But um, I think we will see a revival if we play it well, if we look not only to our own direct benefit, but if we uh, learn from the pandemic what went wrong and how to do the decisions in a way that all profit from this. Thank you. This is actually very encouraging to hear. Uh, the last question, uh, I'm going to pick up on something you just mentioned, that democracy is low, so it goes a bit along these lines. How realistic it is for the European Union to prevent future crises when, as you mentioned, it always acts slowly in times of crisis with the lower common denominator responses? It's an upward spiral. Um, until now, the European uh, Union learned from uh, crisis. And um, if you are a European policymaker, um, you prepare your things, what you want to reach. And when the next crisis comes, you say, this is a solution. Uh, this is not only true for Europe. It's true for each and every government. Uh, when you have a normal process of implementing things, a lot of people will say, yeah, but you have to, we want to have this, we want to have this, or we cannot finance this. So um, a lot of people who have a lot of worries will slow down the process. Um, so when there is a crisis, you have to act uh, fast. On the other hand, we see that there are some general um, lessons learned. For example, the new president of France, Macron, uh, who has now his second term, um, did not help a uh, Zobon speech again, where he said more unity for Europe. No, he said to them, perhaps we should reinvent the idea of a Europe of the two uh, speeds, the two, one move more faster and uh, one less faster. Uh, and they integrate perhaps in certain issue only, but not in all. And because they saw that this um, system of and anonymity votes, everyone has to agree to everything, opens 
the deal for uh, hmm, if I only vote if you please me. So hmm, so that's not a good thing. And there are Hungary and Poland who played this game very well. Uh, no, Turkey is playing this with NATO. Uh, but I think uh, in general, what the landscape will be in 15 years is that you still have a core European Union countries and you have a ring of other countries that work together. In former times, we called them EFTA, the European Trade Agreement Zone. We nearly forgot about this, uh, but I think that might be a way into the future that the full membership is not a digital one, zero out or one in. I think there will be some like in computers and the new computer, the new computers have more than one zero and one, they have uh, things in, uh, in between. So I think if uh, this rational momentum takes a little bit of uh, consideration, then uh, things would speed up. Uh, thank you very much. That was it for the for the Q and A round. You've answered all the questions from our participants, both on YouTube and on Zoom. Uh, and those were good so, questions. I really have to say, audience is very good with the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I just want to uh, mention to Monica if she wants to add a few words. I think her lectures in this MBA healthcare have really resonated with us during your lecture today. So maybe she just wants to say a few words to conclude the session today. Well, thank you very much for this honor, but I don't really have much to add. Um, I think I agree very much with the perspective of Professor Brandt, who very uh, sort of forward looking. I'm convinced about this concept failing forward. Um, I have observed the European health policies first with AIDS, that I think was really the big start. And um, uh, we learned a lot of it, uh, about it, and uh, but we didn't quite learn all the lessons. And when COVID came, there was the issue was economic and not minorities, but the minority issue in AIDS that was played out helped us, I think, a lot to rethink in very modern terms what means universal access and what means the respect of the patient and patient rights and so on. And this is very much uh, inscribed now in national healthcare systems, in the um, attitude of patients and so on. So I really share what was exposed today. Um, what else could I say? Yeah, and I, I tried to introduce a little bit in my own lessons, the idea that there was uh, inside outside, you know, I called it the healthcare system and its environment and insisted a little bit on it. Um, this came out today again uh, around Europe and the European Union and the global health. But uh, we could complete it and say there is past and future nexus as well. And this is all this dynamic about what we learn and then we fail forwards in the next crisis and so on. But about this learning in crisis, there may be something uh, intellectuals and policymakers could think about maybe in these new structures we have in Europe for for global health and for public health in general and for th strengthening healthcare systems. Of course, we only learn from past crises and the lesson may be wrong because the next crisis may be completely different. We don't then need, we don't need respirators maybe in the next crisis about dialysis or, or, or vaccinations or, or masks or whatever. So, um, but they, what we could think about is, is any type of public health crisis, whatever its origin and the transmission ways, what would be the structural, basic, strategic uh, elements that should be sort of prepared? And there are, I think, quite a lot of them if you think about it. So, for instance, to have healthcare systems which are operating and really functioning and universal, and to have a certain number of stocks and human capacity, that should be a sort of basis because whatever is a health crisis or even a war, you will have to cure people, sort of operate and give medicine and so on. And uh, COVID showed this, showed this very, very uh, clearly. So, and then there are all these protection things about something which is infectious. We should think about stock. What is the basic stock of uh, food, medicines and a few other things we would need in any place of the world. 
And another one would be we could prepare, let's say, some sort of uh, strategies of mutual support. What can Europe or the European Union do if there's a major problem in Russia or in, 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 in North Africa, sort of in our neighborhood somewhere? Or what can America do if there's a huge problem in South America? So these, can, these things can be, you know, in, in terms of transport, money provision, uh, items that should be stocked or available or manpower that should be available. How, how can you get more doctors in or more nurses? You can ask students, you can, um, what we call in France, the, the health reserve, you know, retired doctors, retired nurses, uh, students and voluntary people, we all called them into the hospitals during the crisis. So anything which can be done in sort of neighborhood helping and prepare who will be helping whom uh, as a priority and who would be on the second line and what can we do with the army? I mean, countries have these projects very often, but then they did not exercise because they don't have earthquakes like in Japan. The Japanese are very good. They have all this prepared because they have always these earthquakes and um, which come, you know, just from one second to the other and you cannot prepare in, in less than one second. So I think there are sort of basic things and we don't really know what we would need in order to be ready for any type of crisis to be ready at least a 50% or something like this and know who should help whom and what material there should be sort of, what rules should be written, you know, things like this. Um, this is what I would call the sort of the nexus past and future problems. Um, yeah, that's about all. I do believe that the European Union has an important role, maybe the biggest in the world for global health because we have all the ingredients in Europe. We have uh, the values for helping, for, for caring for everybody and keeping air and water clean and things like this. All this is and, and a certain um, idea about corruption, <laughs> not to say there's no corruption in Europe, but there's probably much less than in the rest of the world. So all these very important things that are important for good healthcare systems, Europe has it. And we have the knowledge, we have the universities, we have all this. So, um, so we are, I think, much more capable even than America because they don't have this perception of caring for everybody and sharing equally the charges, the financing. We have this and we have it since a long time. So we can, we, we can propose solutions much quicker than other parts of the world. And we can convince people with our life expectancy and our good standards of living that this is the right way for, for the rest of humanity. Uh, I know we shouldn't teach all our norms to other people, but I think if, when health is concerned, uh, most people in the world would agree that it's good to be in good health and that your neighbor and your parents are in good health too. So there's something to share. Um, we wouldn't need to, to fight all the time about democracy versus dictatorship. Health should be out of this type of battle. And I think Europe can bring the message and the knowledge and part of the know-how. And of course, other, other countries and other cultures can as well, but um, this would be the sort of, you know, <laughs> for the start at least in the center. I think Europe can offer a lot and we just have to do the job, we have to do the work. So I'm rather hopeful for the future, for the European mandate of global health, even if the past was rather slow, but it was always progressing. So there's no reason why it should not progress now in the future. And it will help tackling the aging problem worldwide. And we may have a good partner in Japan because Japan is a very developed country and they care for their people and they have a social security system and they have lots of old people uh, who live a long time. They have the highest life expectancy in the world. So we can maybe take them into our boat for constructed and existing knowledge and know-how and values. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Um... Thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure for us to have uh, an expert like Professor Brand and also like right. Monica with us. And uh, you guide us on the way to go and you explain us in such a simple, simple way the obstacles we, we face in, in global health. And you both have mentioned how optimistic you are about the future. You have mentioned why you find that uh, 
there is reasons for us to 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 look uh, ahead for a better future. So I just want to especially thanks Elmut for joining us today as our expert, and uh, I think mm -hmm. it has been a, a very good session for all all of our audience. Thank you very much. I don't know if Stefano wants to add something. Uh, yes, I think that I will be very, very short. I just want to give a, a very short, actually, reflection on what does it mean to act in the time of emergency. I mean, uh, let's uh, just try to apply this, actually, concept to our everyday life. I mean, if we would act only in the time of emergency, our life and our, actually, job will be a disaster. So uh, I just want to give this um, actually reflection to underline how important it is to select a public administration that is the best of the actually society and also the actually politician, they must be the actually best of the actually society. We are actually living in a time where all the talents, or let's say the 95% of the talents go to the private sector. So we are just actually, we are, uh, how do you say, we are investing our best talent to make money. How this is sustainable? This could, could actually work for the next 20 years, but if we continue, to solve problem at the time of the crisis, this is just not sustainable. So it's only an invite. And I think that this should be taught in the, the actually school and uh, not about that the actually crisis has to be avoided. This is obvious. But what has to be taught inside the actually school is the actually value of the state, the actually value of living in a community, because this is the most important asset that all of us has. We have to learn to live together. This is something that sounds obvious, but is an ongoing process. I just wanted to say this, because I think that health, it's really linked to actually this health, uh, it is, an everyday process, and we cannot solve our health issue when the health issue pop up, then it's too much late normally. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Stefano. Uh, and this is the end of the session. Thank you very much to, to all of you. Bye-bye. Helmut, so are you... Helmut, are you actually a German? Yeah. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess from your name, but you could all yeah, have yeah. always have been yeah, Dutch. Germany now since 12 years in the Netherlands, but uh, you know, the border is not existing. So.